G'day folks, Troy Dean here and welcome to another episode of the WP Elevation podcast. I'm very excited. Our feature guest this week is a good friend of mine and one of our Mavericks Club members, Nevin Harris, all the way from the US of A. Hey Nev, how you doing my friend? I'm doing fantastic, Troy. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for joining us on the show. Now, for those who don't know, who is Nevin Harrison? What are you doing here? Well, Nev Harris is a brand that's out there to help people start having a conversation around the difficult subject of money, Mm. to to get more familiar with their money, to understand their money more and use it as a tool to help grow their business and make better decisions. Why do you think money is such a difficult conversation and such a difficult topic to talk about? Well, it's funny you say that. I I didn't think it was really when I first started down this path. And then I just, I got so much help from people in Mavericks Club and along those lines that I wanted to uh, give something back. So I started trying to look for people having conversations around money to help them and it wasn't happening. So um, I started thinking about it, looking into it. And what I what I think happens is the entrepreneurial culture has ha, has evolved over the last hundred years. You know, when things got easier after post World War II, you know, we we had this boom in entrepreneurship. But what didn't change over the last hundred fifty years is the is the way we talk about money, the way society approaches money, and everything like that. So I just don't. I feel like people who aren't money people mm. don't feel comfortable talking about it. So it, it's never talked about in the home. It's never talked about when we're growing up. We teach algebra two in high school, but we don't teach people how to balance their checkbook. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So Yeah, we don't. Like I never learned about money management in school. I learned about money management from watching my mum sit down every week and balance the checkbook and put bits of cash in envelopes and I would I would ride my bike around the shop and I would go to the post office and I would give over an envelope which had twenty two dollars in it and that was the the fortnightly mortgage payment on the house. And I learned that money was a thing by watching mum do that, but no one ever sat me down and taught me how to balance my budget or, or even organise a, a family budget. And for years, I was hopeless with money. I think there's a lot of fear around money. Is that, has that been your observation as well? Oh, yeah. There's, there's fear in all sorts of different ways. There's, I, I mean, the, the, the most basic fear is fear. I mean, very successful people that I've helped out uh, that – have half million million dollar businesses that are scared to look at their financial statements, scared to look at the scared to look at if they're profitable or not. You know, when I sit down with them and I break down s- some stuff, I'm like, "What are you scared of? You, <laughs> you're you're an extremely successful person." And it's just it's just because it's just that ingrained uh, not understanding of it because it was talked about. You know, it's just tapes we have in our head from when we were kids. Don't talk about money. Mm. Don't you know? So yeah, I definitely think, I think it's fear. I think fear I'm not making enough, fear that if I look at my numbers, they're going to show I'm a failure, you know, fear around all sorts of aspects of it. And what's been your journey? How did you end up in this space where you now want to have this conversation around money and how did you develop the knowledge around business finance management and personal finance management? Well, I was very lucky that to have a slightly different upbringing where my dad was, was a big topic of conversation and I loved it. I love money. I love talking about money. I love doing stuff with money. I went to school to manage money, have a degree in economics and an MBA in finance, did some internships when I was getting out of grad school and realized, shit, I don't want to look at a pod. I don't want to look at spread cat. I mean, uh, spreadsheets um, 12 hours a day. So it wasn't for me. Um, and then, uh, long story short, I had owned a mortgage company where we help people. And then I got, I started an agency seven years ago and it wasn't until I joined Maverick Club actually that I was helping these really successful people, you know, that I become friends with that when we would start talking about this kind of stuff, I'm like, yeah, this is old hat for me. And they were like, oh, I really don't understand this. And, and then I would help them out with that kind of, and it was like, wow. And I was like, really? And so, and they always would push me to do something about it, start talking about it. So about six months ago, I took their advice and I started trying to have conversations around it and I realized they weren't happening. What's the, what are the, if there are like, you know, what, what's the low hanging fruit? If someone's running an agency and they're not looking at their numbers, they're not looking at their books because they're afraid of the unknown because maybe they don't understand what they're looking at. What's the low hanging fruit that they should be looking at to start to identify, okay, these are the numbers and this is where we can improve. What's like the number one thing they should try and drill in and find? So there's, there, there's, I would say, um, one would be control your expenses, mm-hmm. uh, 
do uh, look, look at, I mean, subscriptions are a killer for most people. Mm-hmm. It's just you sign up for it, you put it on a card, you put it coming out of your bank account, and you never look at it again. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's a quick way to like be, become more profitable in the next 30 days. Inventory your old, all your old subscriptions and cancel the ones you don't need. Really sit down and look at stuff and say to yourself, you know, do do I need this? What do I have? What do I need this for? Do I have anything else that will replace it? And I bet you could get rid of about half of what you do. I mean, even us, you know, even me, like with my agency, we we, we do this once yearly and we always have bloat. Mm, I mean, you could always. be so um, that's definitely uh, that's definitely one thing they could get a hold of pretty simply. Um, I, I wouldn't mind diving in and talking about margins if you if you're up for that because I think the sure, business that it. we're in, like we don't make physical product, we're all in the service-based business or the digital business, and our margins can typically be quite high. As a rule of thumb, if someone's just starting out building websites for clients, growing an agency, what kind of margins, gross and net, should they be looking for? And maybe it would be worth breaking down. What is the difference between a gross profit margin and a net profit margin? Yes, yes. Two words I dislike intensely. <laughs> <laughs> because what the hell is why 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 the same word and why gross and why net and why profit? You know, this is this is where I think um, uh, to go off on a little bit of a rant here. I think um, money. What I was talking about, money is brought up and talked about um, in this way that the the language hasn't evolved. Why are we still calling it that stuff? Why don't we just call it the money you bring in, your revenue, the sales you have? And the money you make, your income, but we call it uh, gross income and net income, and it's just confusing because you're using the same word for, and then you're putting a word that most people don't understand in front of it, and then you're like, understand this. Mm. So, um, but yeah, so back to your subject, I think so. Uh, I, I think the the simplest, most easiest way for people to get a hand a handle this, especially if they're if they're new to this, trying to figure this out, is the rule of thirds. Mm-hmm. You know, you break down. Um, you have a third, I like to call your direct costs, um, and those are costs going to be uh, directly related to any project you're doing. A third of it is your, I call them the keep your lights on cost. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're the costs that, you know, that you're going to have every month, no matter if you get it, bring in one project or 10 projects. And then you have a third that you could allocate to um, your profit, your the money you make. So, um now we could throw throw a salary in there, hopefully at some point, and that would go into your um, uh, indirect cost. But yeah, so, so you so, keep your lights on cost. Yeah, so just to be clear, indirect cost or keep your lights off cost, they're costs that the business has to pay for regardless of whether or not you take on any projects. They're just the cost of doing business, keeping the lights on, paying the rent, paying the staff, you know, uh, paying for any software to run the business, your computer lease, all that kind of stuff, electricity, all that kind of stuff, internet connection, telephones. And then the direct costs are costs directly related to taking on a project. So for example, you might have to hire another developer to come in and do some freelance work for you to finish the project. You might have to buy some certain plugins or theme licenses for that particular project. And they are directly related to taking on that project because if you didn't take on the project, you wouldn't have incurred those costs, right? Right, right. And let me clear up something that's a whole um, kind of when when you get down, dig down into it, it gets a little murky. Here, here's what I say about it. If it's if you have somebody, you pay a salary that you owe them that paycheck every month, no matter how many projects you bring in, they're an indirect cost. Mm. Um, if you have if you're hiring a contractor that you're only bringing in to do that job, that's a direct cost. Because you could try to then slice it up and say, well, it's 60% they do like working on my business and 40% in this and my VA does kind of some project management. Then it gets really murky and really confusing and everybody just throws their hands up and say, I knew I couldn't understand this. I told you, Nev, it's not for me. <laughs> and so we make it super clear for them. You know, boom, boom. So If they're on staff, they're, a, they're, a, they're a, uh, an indirect cost. If they're hired on a contract basis to complete projects, they're a direct cost. And so the rule of thirds says for every $10,000 I make, you know, about, you know, roughly no more than 3300 should go to direct cost, no more than 3300 to indirect cost, and then the 3400 left over goes into the business owner's pocket as profit, right? Right, right, right. And at no, what we po- could get you, sorry. you got as I say, at what size business do we start saying, well, now we're making enough that the business owner can take a salary, and that goes into direct, uh, goes into indirect costs, and there's profit left over. Typically, like at what kind of turnover level should they be starting to think about that? Well, 
I think that, I mean, you could have a million dollar business that has $990,000 in uh, expenses and you can't afford to pay yourself a salary. And, or you could have a $200,000 business with $40,000 worth of expenses that you, you know, you're easily could pay yourself a salary. And so I, I don't, uh, hard and fast rules mm. when it comes to something like that. I don't know if I'm uh, uh, a, a huge fan of, but I think if you're, if, if you're definitely um, making, bringing in, I would say mm, somewhere around uh, eight to 10,000 a month in profit, you could probably then cut yourself out uh, a nice little income. I, what I would do if you have an accountant, um, there's corporate structures that you could set up and some are, some are more tax advantaged. That means you could get like a tax benefit. Sorry for using confusing words there. Yeah. Th that you, you could set yourself up of, and there could be benefit to having um, to taking a salary as opposed to not. So um, as opposed to just paying yourself um, just with the profit. So what, what would we call take a distribution? So yeah, yeah I, th I think it's a could be a much more complex conversation that yeah. Yeah, similar, so, similar sorry, here. Not a simple answer. No, 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 not at all. I mean, there are no simple answers to these questions. That's the whole, the whole point. I think of the conversation and why I love what you're doing so much because this is murky stuff. This is, this is not cut and dry. It's not ones and zeros. It's not like installing a plugin and the thing works or it doesn't. This is, you know, this can get difficult. It can get awkward, and I think that's why a lot of people shy away from it. Uh, similar in Australia, we have corporate structures here in Australia, which means I don't get paid a salary as such. I get I get a very small salary, and then I get profit distributions every quarter, which I can draw down monthly or I can draw down quarterly. Um, because if I take too much of a salary, then I end up paying too much personal tax. So we have trust setups and and different corporate structures here that we can use for similar reasons. Um, if you're just starting out, and in the states, I believe there are some there are some uh, districts where you can register a company that is better for tax purposes, like Nevada and Delaware. Is that right? Yes, there's um, there's, there's like a lot of financial companies are going to register in Delaware. Um, there's uh, Florida has uh, uh, preferential tax rates, but. That, that I mean, for small businesses just starting out, I wouldn't suggest uprooting your whole life and moving to Florida, no. even though it would be really nice because it's snowing outside right now, and I'm really unhappy about <laughs> that. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so um, uh, yeah, there's uh, there's there's definitely you know you could get into you know really fine tuning that if you're and and hey, if you could create the digital no man life that you're teaching people how to do, that's mm. a perfect way to do. It. Then you then you should be registered in the Bahamas. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And pay very little tax. Yeah, Bali or somewhere like that. <laughs> yeah, and so what? Are, what else? What are, at what point when we're just starting out? At what? At what point should we think about like hiring a bookkeeper or hiring an accountant to take care of this stuff for us? Because a lot of people are scared to spend the money when they're starting. They're like, oh, I'm not going to pay a bookkeeper, you know, four hundred bucks a month or whatever it is to do my books. I'm just going to do it myself. Well, I I believe very uh, strongly about um, uh, the value of accountants and even bookkeepers. Well, here, here's accountant is going to make you money. You know, if you hire an accountant, it will make you. If, and if you use him right, you know, in in tax planning, we're in, in my Facebook group. We're just doing a series coming up on um, tax planning, mm -hmm. and we're, we're we're teaching people every week now how to you know use tax planning use what you could do during the year mm -hmm. to really benefit yourself and how if you're paying an accountant like uh five hundred dollars a year a thousand dollars a year he should be a, he should be giving you a tax advice that's three times that value mm. now a bookkeeper i would think when when i think a bookkeeper should be one of your first hires because it's work you don't like doing it's busy work and it's not highly paid work so i think that should be one of your first hires to get that right off your plate and um, and then be able to look at the statements and the numbers she gives you to use those as a guide to to grow your business with. So and, and a lot of times your accountant can have a bookkeeper or you could just get a bookkeeper off the side. But the accountant should be you should. And that's what I my, what I'm trying to help people do is have better conversations with their accountants mm. so that, you know, they understand like finance at money at a, at a base level that they know when they need to go ask their accountant a question so that he can save the money because accounts are introverted people and a lot of times they're not going to approach you with planning advice because they don't want to seem salesy mm. but you know i talk to my accountant at least once a month i don't make any big financial decisions without talking to my accountant and i know this stuff mm. inside and out but I, I still i want somebody that you know it's every day in those laws so what are and it's a nice segue because that was the next question i was going to ask is what are some of those 
uh, those foundational questions that you need to start asking an accountant. If, if, if you haven't done this before, you've hired an accountant, or maybe you've got an accountant, but they, you're just talking to them once a year to do your, your tax compliance work, what are the questions that you should be asking them throughout the year? So, for example, if you want to buy new equipment, do you want to uh, purchase that outright? Do you want to lease it? If you have, say you have like a big, huge chunk of money coming in and, and maybe it's you, you defer this to the next year and you're thinking to yourself, okay, do I have a ton of income this year that I could use that um, uh, expense that I could write off, you know, write off is all, all write off is a tax deduction. So if I know that I'm going to make $200,000 this year and I could put in, and I know I'm going to have to uh, pay my hosting bill or or buy um, buy new computers or something like that, or maybe I need a new car and I could figure a way to get that through the business. And then I want to take, I want to buy that money, I want to spend that this year mm. so that I could lower my taxable income. Or maybe next year I know I'm going to be making, maybe I know this was a, an off year, a low year. So I mean, and your accountant could help you be tracking that and you're going to them and asking about how should I buy this? You know, when should I buy this? And and, and that, it could be the difference of, you know, getting what, what could affect like a 20, 30 percent discount on that kind of stuff. If you're if you're using your account right, if you're planning it right for tax purposes. How does this feed into personal finance as well? Because one of the things that I've seen happen is uh, business owners, entrepreneurs trying to reduce their personal tax liability by doing this clever kind of stuff. But then fast forward five years when they look to buy a house, they're their past income doesn't look as favourable to the banks as it could because they've been reducing their tax along the way. So I know this is a tricky question and totally off the <laughs> script and I've just thrown you under the bus. But um, how, how does, I, I guess the question is, how, you know, we, we need to be careful about the business decisions we make and how that might affect our personal financial situation, right? Right. Well, nothing is looked at in a vacuum and you're, you're exactly right. If you, you could... Uh, you write off your income as much as possible. You show a, la uh, a lower income. But I just happen to have owned a mortgage company for <laughs> <laughs> seven, eight years in the past. So I am well suited to answer this curveball question. <laughs> Excellent. Um, no. <laughs> Excellent. So um, uh, it's you, you can you can do what what's called like stated mortgages, where where you're just kind of stating your income. Now you are going to pay a higher interest rate if you cannot prove your income. So, but um, uh, you got to take that as um, a, you know, so I'm going to pay a little bit higher on interest rate for a house in five years, but I was able to save five years worth of taxes. And again, this is this this is a great personal. This is going back to your last question. That's the kind of stuff to talk to your accountant about. Hey, look, yeah. I'm thinking about buying a house in the next couple of years. What should we do? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one situation where you want to put all the money you can on the books and, and, and show as much money as can if, if we want to sell your business mm. because your business is sold off, you know, most of your business should be sold off in a technical term, your free cash flow, which basically just means the, the, the money that's coming in, the profit that's coming in, they'll value the business off of that. And if you're showing 80, but you know, you're making 150, you know, your business is going to be valued off of multiple of that 80, mm. you know, not off that 150. So mm. that's, that's when you want to be definitely showing as much money as possible with the rest it's um it, it's it's a uh, it's a play-by-play -play decision as to what you're trying to do in the future what are your goals are and what what do you need to show money for and how much money do you need to show because if you're trying to buy a house that's uh three hundred thousand and you know you have very little debt you know it's really not going to matter whether you make like eighty thousand or ninety thousand a year because you know, your debt to income ratio where they compare how much debt you have and how much money you're making is it's it, you're still going to fall below that threshold. Mm. And there might just be. And, and by the way, um, if you're listening to this podcast and you're in Australia, that's right. I just want to clarify. You can't buy a house in Australia for three hundred thousand dollars. You might get a caravan, but you can't buy a house. <laughs> we have uh, I think is what is now uh, now uh, quantified as the most expensive uh, property uh, in terms of relative to our income in the world. Um, so, uh, uh, but what, what what a strategy that you might use is if you want to buy a property 
uh, then you might just for a two year period, you might declare, you might pay a little more tax because you might actually declare higher personal income for a two year period, knowing that I'm going to buy a house in two years so that when it comes time to go talk to the banks, you've got a two year history there, which looks good. And then once you've actually in the property and you've got the finance, then you might just wind that back and pay less tax next year. So there are some short and medium term strategies that you can employ. Um, and again, uh, all good advice is to talk to your accountant. Um, I want to talk about pricing a little bit because one way to solve – money doesn't solve all problems, but it sure as hell helps. So one way to solve a lot of financial problems is just to earn more money, right? Increase the top line, increase the revenue. You and I have talked about this a lot at Mavericks Club events. We're both abundant thinkers. We're both always thinking about how to add more value and how to raise more revenue. Talk to us about the different pricing models that you might adopt when you're starting out that could pay dividends over the next three, four, five years. Because I know when a lot of people first start out – they just go. They just go for the hourly rate, which drives me nuts uh, because they don't know any other pricing models. So, what are some of the other pricing models that you can look at, which will help your revenue? So, um, I yeah, we've talked about this. I've I've done some research into this, and I'll tell you the bad ones. Uh, definitely hourly, mm -hmm. and definitely project based pricing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just uh, pricing, um, it's it's pretty much you get into. Um, uh, uh, without being able to show, but you can't really show value with project-based pricing. Mm -hmm. So you end up, you know, in a race to the bottom, you know, and then you're going to, if you win that race, you lose. And if you don't win that race, you lose. <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> That's right. If you win that race, you lose. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a shit way to price. Um, and then there's, um, uh, the best way to do it is, uh, well, there's a couple, there, there, there's a better way to do it. It's, it's more like if you could show like value-based pricing, if mm -hmm. you could show that, um, taking the, uh, uh, th what they're going to get out of uh, it. So if they're going to make, say, um, if you're going to design a new web website for them and you know that website, they're going to be able to make $30,000 on that website, you know, um, if, because if clients, you know, you have this conversation with, with, with them about this and then, you know, you know, you know, you could charge them 10,000 for that website, you know, but then, um, so you just showed them that they, that they could afford to spend 10,000 on a website, but not that you're the person to spend that money with. Mm. So you run into that problem to be in shop too, you know, okay, well, I need a new website. I needed this. So you're doing a lot of kind of free consulting from in that case. Well, what you need to do in that case then is step it up to establishing premium positioning. Mm -hmm. Because now if you've established premium positioning with their mind and you show them to walking through like customer value, lifetime value and you know, what it's, what it's worth to that client to have a new website or a, a new digital marketing campaign, a new mm. Facebook ads, whatever it is, you know, then if you have the premium positioning, they know you're the one to go to. So they're not only, you've not only showed them they could afford it, you show them they could afford you because they've already decided they want to do business with you because you've already positioned yourself. Yeah. I love it. I could talk about this for weeks. In fact, I think I have been talking about this for the last six years. Uh, one of the, so, so immediate immediate pushback that I get from people is like, well, how can I prove to my clients that their website can make money for them? My argument, my response to that is, is that if you can't prove that a new website, for example, that's what we're in the business of selling, if you can't prove that a new website is going to add economic value to your client's business, then you probably shouldn't be in the game of selling and creating websites for clients. Now, it might not just be financial. It might be if you're working with nonprofits, it might be helping them expand their donor database. If you're working with schools, for example, it might be drastically reducing their admin overhead by disseminating information through a parent portal, which saves the school, you know, $55,000 a year in in, in teacher expenses from answering the same question or admin overhead expenses for answering the same question over and over again. I worked with a dance school once a husband and wife team and their two daughters worked in the dance school. And the husband said to me, he did all the books. And he said to me, you know, I pay my daughters $20 an hour and they spend most of their time on the phone answering the same question to our, our uh, that they ran a, a kid's dance school. The parents would call up asking about the timetable. When's dance class on this week? Because I need to get the kids from school and get them out of daycare and get them over to the, the dance school and blah, blah, blah. He said, my daughters spend all day on the phone answering the same question over and over again. I pay them 20 bucks an hour. I said, you need one web page, not a website, just one web page that you can populate your timetable on. Use WordPress, it's an easy to use content management system. Stick it up one page, put your timetable there, email that link to your parents and say, here you go, go check out the timetable whenever you want. We'll build it responsively, it's a no-brainer. 
it might cost you three grand for one web page, you'll make that money back in a month, right? Because now all of a sudden your daughters aren't on the phone answering the same question over and over again, and your daughters can actually do something more valuable for the business in the time that they've freed up. So if you can't have a conversation with your clients about the economic value that your website is going to add to their business, then you need to up your game, right? Yeah, I would. Uh, that's an excellent point you just made there. But uh, I, I would add to that if 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 they need a, a technique to use there, I would say if is ask them why do they want a website. You know, yeah. if 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 you don't believe your website can make you money, why do you even want it? Let's <laughs> exactly. just get rid of the whole website thing. <laughs> that's correct. Let's just take it down offline. Like you don't even. Yeah. Let's let's just get rid of it. And then the client will start selling you as to why they need a website. No, 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 no. I need a website for this. this. Yeah. Oh, so you need a web. And then you go back. So what What do you think that point A that you made to me, what do you think that will make? Worth. What do you think? And then right there, you've just, That's right. you know, that you've had them in their own words outlined for you why they need a new website. And, you know, sometimes it's about pride as well. I had a, an accounting firm approach me once and they said, we need a new website because every time we go to networking events and we hand out our business card, we cringe because we know people are going to go home and Google us and our website website's embarrassing, right? I said, well, what is it worth to you to be able to go to a networking event and proudly hand out your business card, knowing that when people hit that website, that it's a great experience and you'll likely attract better clients, right? That was about a six page website with a very basic blog and a price tag of 15 grand because those accountants wanted to go out to networking events and proudly hand out their business card. There was no, no transactions happening on the website. So it was, a, it was a branding pride status thing, yeah? So our job really is to uncover the value, right? Right, exactly, because they're not going to those networking events for the bad appetizers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, yeah, they're mainly going for the after-party drinks, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> so, all right, let's 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 pretend that everyone paying attention to this podcast is a compliant listener and they're frantically taking notes and they're saying, this is great, I'm going to put my prices up, I'm going to position myself as a premium provider, I'm even going to make the leap and talk about getting people on retainers and build some sweet recurring revenue. Um, how, what's, what, apart from going through your subscriptions and having a look at uh, the low-hanging fruit there and cutting your expenses, get, what else can we do in terms of managing our profit margins and making sure that we're running a profitable business as we grow? Because one mistake I've made in the past is growing the business, growing revenue, employing a whole bunch of new people to deliver on, the, on those promises and making more revenue but not actually making more profit. So... Um, what. Here's so here's the other thing about pricing is it, it's it's you need a predictable product because you need to be able to know what your expenses are going to be. Mm. You need a product you sell that gives you um, A through Z. So it's going to you're going to buy this product from me. It's going to give you six things. And I know exactly how much those six things are. And I've done those six things, six things like a hundred times over. So I know exactly how much time they're going to take. Because what do we all do? Scope creep. I mean, as an agency owner myself, I mean, scope creep killed me, mm. you know, until I met you. <laughs> and, <laughs> plug for Troy, because I love Troy. He's helped me out a ton with my business. So, um, no, really. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so if, you, if you're not selling anything, if you're selling something that you don't know how much is going to cost you, and you don't know exactly how to contain those costs, you, you're, you're in for just, you know, you're, you're, you're letting it up the chance because a customer will always always want more than you give them and they just they don't understand the boundaries mm. so you need to you need to have clear um a clear product that you're selling to them and websites can be a product a service can be a product you know i'm sure he's taught, yeah. taught on that a thousand times and i won't paraphrase the master but yeah um so yeah so and and so that now so when you have that that now controls your indirect cost that now controls your project related cost so now that you have your project related costs under control and you've you've honed down on your subscriptions and you're honed down on, you know, all your um, you don't have you haven't you don't have hiring bloat, like I call it, where you've um, where you have a whole team that's not like um, uh, like working to their capacity. I call it um, uh, hiring and managing ad, ad hoc hiring and managing. It's just like I think I need this person. So I'm going to hire this person on a salary because I have one project that I could use this person for. Mm. You know, then all of a sudden you have a team of eight and you have work for a team of five. Yeah. So, you know, so you, we've, you have a predictable product and we've honed in. We know exactly what our indirect costs are going to be. And we know that we've, um, we're running lean on our direct costs. And then, you know, we have premium positioning, so we're able to charge 
uh, we're, we're I charge a lot, you know, when and we know how to uh, elicit value from our to our customers. So now, you know, that's you know, that's the framework for that. Um, and I have another point on that, but I think I've talked enough, so I'm going to kick it back to you, Troy. Yeah, and it's a great point. And having that predictable product is a big, scary mental leap for people to take. But it's, uh, in my experience, uh, a bespoke client services business where you're basically changing the service every time a client walks in the door is extremely difficult to grow that kind of business profitably unless you have a crap ton of cash in the bank as a runway and you can grow that business really big so you've got dedicated account managers dedicated project managers dedicated designers and developers ready to go when a project goes live it's it's really difficult business model to grow there's a huge dip as seth godin calls it that dip you've got to get through for that type of business model is very big and takes a very long time and is very difficult to get through that dip so productizing your services into something that is more predictable is a uh, a much faster route to get through it. What What was your other point that you were going to make? So, uh, well, uh, I could say one. So, you get your financial statements. You know, now you have your bookkeeper, you have your accountant, or you have your QuickBooks, and uh, and and you have these that are that are very scary because they're written in a language that that um uh that's not meant for you to understand. So, uh, but you look at them and you have all your operating expenses. Now all operating expenses are pretty much your uh, direct costs. And then you have cost of goods sold and that's pretty much your indirect costs. Why don't we call them that? I don't know because the, because that conversation has evolved. So so let's just take your, let's just take all your expenses, those two categories of expenses. And uh, you wanna look at, so you, you look at them for one month and you're like, oh, I made a profit. Oh, I didn't make a profit, you know, and that's it. Well, what you wanna look at is at least six months and you wanna say, how are things trending? And you want the trend is the big thing because the trend is your friend or it's your enemy. Mm. You have to know if you have an enemy out there. Yeah. You know, and if um, so, if you see that your subscriptions are creeping up, creeping up, creeping up, you know, I need to go back and look at my subscriptions. If you know, you notice that you have more sales, like you like going back to your original point. If you have more sales. And the, but your your profit isn't higher. Your you, you have more sales, but your income isn't higher. You need to be able to look and see. Okay, what trend is getting more expensive, and and why is that? Because like I said, if you have you know if all of a sudden you know you don't need eight people on staff anymore, mm. you know that you're um uh, that maybe you have some bloat in your uh, in your payroll, or maybe it's just because. Um, so you had uh, maybe you have a credit card, which you should really not be having like balances on your credit card, but maybe you do. And maybe all of a sudden you lost at zero percent intro rate and now it's 18 percent. Yeah. So now your credit card bill. And this, so you're looking at the trends, not like, oh, yeah, you know, I made money. I didn't make money. That's one month. It's a snapshot. It really, you know. I mean, you, you have a gut feel whether you made money or not, yeah. but it's the trends that are going to help you. A hundred percent. And you can you can kid yourself. You can fool yourself into thinking, we're doing really well. We've got cash in the bank. Oh, yeah. We've got, you know, everything. We've made profit this month. But you, you, you're absolutely right. The trend is your friend. Even if the trend tells you something you don't want to see or that you don't like, the trend is your friend. I agree with that. The thing about the credit card, uh, full disclosure, we use credit cards in this business to pay for just about everything because we earn heaps of points using those credit cards and we can then use those points to redeem for things like flight flights, accommodation and travel, which we use a lot. However, that credit card, we pay zero interest on those credit cards because the balance is paid off in full multiple times a month. So it is like every week, we're just smashing that balance down to zero. So there is no chance of us uh, not um, paying any interest and getting stung on that. So that's something to look out for. Credit cards can be a friend when it comes to rewards and points, but you just got to make sure you've got your system set up so that you can pay them off in full every month. Hey, this is, I, go on. Could I just say yeah, one please. thing on that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, because I am a huge I like proponent of using credit cards for for a couple reasons. One, because of what you just said, Mavericks. We fly all sorts of cool places. I came to Australia for two and a half weeks. Yeah. I haven't paid for a flight. Yeah, awesome. you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of that, that's right. Um, I go out uh, when I uh, everything cash flow to manage your cash flow. Like we have a whole training on this, but it's it's a it's a great tool to manage your cash flow if you pay it off every month. I'm not saying go crazy with it, mm. but I'm just saying it could really be used. Because if you get set up everything that go on a credit card and then you're looking at one time a month that you have expenses and you get set up your revenue coming in, 
before you have that one time. It's you're not being peckered to death mm. with 30 different payments you're making every month. Yeah. So it's 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 a great cash flow management tool. It's a great reward kind of tool. But you have to have the discipline to be able to use it effectively. I know there's some other financial gurus out there. They're going to be very well, very much against it. Um, so let me just say this. I have ADD and I know that my time management skills are crap. So I know there's things I can't do. I can't check Facebook during the day. I can't mm. get on these things because I know I'll lose an hour. Mm. So if you know you're not going to be good with managing like credit like that, maybe you don't have a credit card. But yeah. for for and that's just a limitation you have. We all have limitations. But yeah. people that can manage it, it's an absolute excellent tool for that. Yeah. Sorry, I'll get off the soap. No, I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Bring it on. Uh, so hey, this has been super interesting. I could do this, uh, you know, for weeks, as I said, but I am conscious of everyone's time and respectful of your time as well. If people want to reach out to you and keep this conversation going, where is the best place that people can connect with you and ask you questions and keep the conversation going about money management and financial management in their business? Yeah, great. We have a Facebook group. It's Tank Tank for agency owners and freelancers. It's inspired by Mavericks Club, the, um, the all the help, the community we have there, which we're com creating a community around there. Um, twice a week, we give financial training, but the rest of the week, it's for people to come in and ask questions and get help from other agency owners and freelancers. Um, define that because that's a really long title I just gave you. <laughs> um, Nev Harris. <laughs> yeah, I made it simple. Um, NevHarris.com slash Facebook group. So again, N E V Nathan Edward Victor Harris H A R R I S dot com slash Facebook group, and we'll redirect right to our Facebook group so you can join it. Awesome. So we'll all also, sorts of free training. We'll also stick a link of that uh, in the show notes here. NevHarris.com slash Facebook group is where you go to connect with Nev and join the free Facebook group. Hey, Nev, thank you so much for spending some time with us on the WP Elevation podcast. I'm so glad we made this happen and uh, wish you all the best for the future and look forward to seeing you in California in February for the next MavCon. Yes, sir. I can't wait. Excited. Thanks, awesome. Troy. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. That's another episode of the WP Elevation podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please get on over to wpelevation.com slash iTunes or wpelevation.com slash Stitcher and subscribe to the show and leave us a rating and a review. And you can connect with us on YouTube and Facebook, which is where we spend most of our time. I uh, look forward to speaking with you again next week on the podcast. Until then, I'm Troy Dean. Go Elevate.